All right, Amber okay. Rowland. How are you All doing? Right. I'm doing great. Busy, busy day. Normal mom duties here. Now I, I have a mom life, <laughs> but yeah, everything, everything's really good. Well, that's good. Uh, I know that you are, I'm sure you're pretty busy. You're a pretty busy person on top of your mom <laughs> duties. So yeah. you do, um, you, you do public speaking and uh, what else do you do? So I, I do public speaking. Um, I've been doing that since 20, let's say 17 now. So it's been five years um, on emotional intelligence. And I'll get into how I got into that, which is a great story. But I also am a celebrity correspondent for a Millennium Magazine. And then three in 2020, I started my own speaking um, engagement at my home that I've been hosting for women only. Um, not so much women empowerment, but in a way of just bringing women together that are successful, that have careers and um, they're leaders in their community, entrepreneurs. And I wanted to highlight them because I, I kind of felt that a lot of the um, women only events I've attended kind of, I don't know, it just kind of lacked. I mean, I, gosh, it's going to sound like I'm slamming on women, but <laughs> a lot of it kind of like lacked what I needed. So mm -hmm. instead of complaining about it, I went ahead and kind of created my own event, which is the third, this will be the third year. And um, we could talk about that too, because it's Christmas theme this year and I'm pretty excited about that so yeah it's, it's all good things listen everything that I do um, my goal is just to bring positivity some type of positivity into the world and you know we're, we're living in a very unique time right now um, because of social media and regular media and politics it's just I feel like there's just been a lot of toxic energy going around the last few years and of course if you go online you'll see people just whine and complain about it and I always live by the model of, you know, model, mod, motto, <laughs> <What's that word? laughs> uh, you know, be the change you seek. And so instead of whining about it, I'm like, all right, you know what? I, I can't control all these outside factors, but I could control me, my own energy, my own space, people that interact with me on a daily basis, people that interact with me, that meet me for the first time, that see me at my speaking engagements, that read my stories. You know, I could be a light. I could be sending some type of positive you know signal to somebody and the outside world and i think if enough of us do that if all of us look within ourselves and start doing that by ourselves then we absolutely can you know change this whole you know cycle of toxicity that's been going on yeah you and i in similar manners kind of do the same thing because this mm -hmm. podcast is i mean that's that's the purpose of the podcast is to help put positivity out into the world yeah um, but that's one thing that I've noticed is by like having something that you're involved in that creates positivity also mm -hmm. kind of negates like you wanting to be negative. Like, right. It gives you purpose. It gives you something to focus on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, we, we hear it all the time. And listen, um, <laughs> I have my bad moments too, without a doubt. You're going to hear me, you know, I'll have a rough day and I'll be whining or snapping at my husband or my kids. <laughs> but how, you know, when I, as I've the last, I mean, I've been studying human behavior since, gosh, I don't know, since last 20 plus years. Wow. However, I never really, you know, it's like I read, 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 but I didn't really take actionable steps mm -hmm. until like 2016 or actually online, you know, really it's more so when my first, my second child was born, but really diving deep into it in 2016. And when I learned to actually take those actionable steps, I saw the changes in me. And then when I started changing, I saw my environment changing, you know, where you start seeing more good than you notice the bad. Can I ask you what, what was it that happened in your life or not necessarily happened, but what moment, mm -hmm. what moment was it that made you realize that you wanted to kind of change your life? And <laughs> what, were, what were the first, what were the first steps? I remember it like it was yesterday. <laughs> okay, so I was pregnant with my second son. Uh, I have two boys. They're 14 years apart. So it's two totally different dynamics. Um, I was, so when I was pregnant with my second child, I was going for my master's degree in education, special ed, and child psychology as well. And I was having a hard time because my son, my older son, who was 14, he, he was just going through that terrible preteen stage. 
and just very combative and good kid, but just, you know, he was testing me, testing me bad and testing my husband. Now my husband's not his natural father. So that kind of added more tension because now it's like he was the only child his whole life. And now here's mom who just got married and now she has a new baby coming. So I, I get that he was feeling, you know, kind of like an outsider at that point. He felt like, you know, mom was building this whole new family and here I am. So he was really lashing out. But it was a whole new experience for me where I didn't really have the tool set to be able to nurture him or give him what he needed or really understand his pain at that time. And it was really difficult with my husband because this is all new to my husband as well. So he was getting like really frustrated. So the two of them will clash and I'm stuck in the middle, pregnant, writing my thesis <laughs> from graduate school. And it was just a big, it was probably the most difficult few years of my life. And I happened to be stu um, studying child psychology when I was doing my master's. And so I started learning about behaviors and, and the brain and, you know, how, it's, how to speak to somebody and give them what they need and like discipline, because like, while I, I had like old school discipline, like it wasn't working. I had to find something that was going to work because there's not, you know, a one size fits all for parenting. When you, when, you say, when you say old school discipline, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, you know, like just punishing him constantly. Like, oh. you know, if he's doing something wrong, I would punish him, take it away. Never explaining to him what, why he was being punished. You understand? Like I wasn't explaining the behavior. Like this is why you're getting punished. This is why I'm taking your phone away. This is why I'm taking your video school, uh, video games away. Um, just doing it, but being angry. You know, mm -hmm. I'd be yelling. I would yell and scream and just, um, I, I don't, I'm not, I, I was not, never a hitter. <laughs> I grew up being hit. So uh, that was something that I didn't ever do with my kids, which I don't believe in that. Um, but screaming and yelling and taking, you know, punishing without actually giving them an explanation because we just as parents assume that our kids know better. Well, they don't know better unless they're being taught it. So I was never teaching it to the begin with. And obviously, you know, he had all these emotions that were going on that I wasn't, uh, you know, giving him the time and space to be able to try and communicate because he didn't have the words to communicate at the time. And of course, you know, being pregnant with my hormones, it was just a really, really bad, toxic <laughs> mix up of everything. So that's when I started really like, I'm like, listen, I, I, I was just being so miserable and I, I knew I had to make a change, which is why I really dove deep. So, um, you know, long story short, what happened was I, I just really started really getting into human behavior, teaching it or learning it rather for myself, for my children. And it definitely wasn't an overnight thing that happened because when the older one was going through high school, you know, it was four years of like learning and processing. But, you know, the little one, the younger one, Matea, which uh, you got to see at the event in Chicago, he benefited because mommy was already going you know, learn. So I started teaching him these skill sets at a very young age. And then eventually when Joey, the older one got into college and it was like his second year of college that everything just started clicking, you know? <laughs> so, you know, it's so all the parents out there that are struggling. Like it, you, you can definitely like heal and heal these relationships and teach your kids the tool sets, but don't expect an overnight success. It took a solid four years to really work on myself and also teach my kids what they needed to be able to communicate. And, you know, I think the underlying thing is they just want to know that they're loved. And it's really important because we, as parents, kind of just assume our kids know that a lot of times. But, you know, they all need to be expressed uh, or shown in different ways. And that through that is when I really started getting into the study of emotional intelligence. And I once I learned about emotional intelligence, I totally just like fell in love with it. I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like here, now I have all these, this whole mental toolkit now to like help myself grow as a person to get past my own traumas. You know, I had my own traumas growing up as a child that were never healed. So I learned that 90% of the time when I was lashing out had nothing to do with the situation at that moment, but rather, you know, traumas for the past that were never taken care of. And once I learned to put the work in 
and understand where my pain was coming from and learn to forgive and learn to move forward and learn to think before I speak, learn to listen, to understand people, um, then things just sort of really all coming together. I think that's really important. And it's, it's important that you, you realize it at a relatively young age too, because mm -hmm. a lot of people kind of go through this cycle in life where they allow their past traumas to affect their mm -hmm. adulthood and their, their children's lives. And then that's yeah. how the generational trauma. Absolutely. And I, Listen, it's it's all around us. Every single one of us, none, none of us gets to escape that trauma. We, you know, some might just have it worse than others. Um, you know, I see it with friends who talk to me about it, and I repeat over and over again, like, like, listen, I know it's really hard work. You know, you have to go back, and you know, whether you go to professional help, which I've done before in the past, um, I had mentors in the past. I've been read certain books that really just opened my eyes. I read this one book by. Robert Holden called Lovability. And when I read that book, I was like, oh my gosh, like this is it. Like it, everything just like clicked for me. And, but I had to put the work in and it was not easy at all. However, it's so much more refreshing because if I hadn't put the work in, you know, I would be like this miserable person right now still and lack confidence in myself and not be a, an effective, you know, loving mother and wife as I am today. So that I think that's why a lot of people don't want to put the work in because it's it's you're revisiting very uncomfortable situations. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it, you have to be self-reflect, like self-reflective, mm -hmm. be open to admitting that you were wrong and open to admitting yeah. that you have done things differently. Well, well, my husband and I talk about it a lot because, you know, he had his own traumas through his childhood too but him and I kind of are got on the same page together which really was beneficial and what we both say now together is like we kind of feel like we're like leaders of our families from both sides and not in an arrogant way in any way but showing that listen you know we had to he broke the chain of you know toxicity in his life in his family and I broke it in mine. And if you meet both of my boys now, you can see they, they were not like the kids that like uh, me and my husband grew up as. Like they have a whole different perspective of life. I mean, they never cease to like amaze me. My son, the younger one more so because he was born into like having, learning like the different toolkits of how to use words to speak, how to like not act so much on emotion and listen to understand, listen to different perspectives. I mean, he's eight years old and he's walking around saying like, I'm going to listen at different perspectives to understand why, you know, my cousin's being mean to me. <laughs> and it's like, it was like really cool to see that. It was, he was kind of like my little experiment, but, <laughs> but like literally to this day, I mean, he just went through something at, in high school and he was just not phased by it. You know, some Kid, some kid was like saying very unkind things about this club that he had started. And of course it's me, like my mama bear action comes out like, oh my gosh, how dare he say this? And Mateo's just like, what mom? He's like, please. It's like, it's like, why should I, what difference does it make, you know, what he thinks? You know, this is what, this is my project. This is what I'm doing. And I'm like, oh wow. Like he, he's that, good. That's really cool. It, it, it's cool to see it in your kids. I, I mean, and I would, Go as far to say as he's probably better at it than I am mm. because he didn't grow up with that, you know, with that trauma that I grew up with. And this might be a lot of people, I don't know, people might not like hearing me say this, but if you have the option, like I really feel that you should at a young age, like learn to heal your traumas before you even have kids or at least go towards this step because it, it's heartbreaking, you know, seeing these children in these terrible situations with the parents just not caring or not even knowing how to raise them in a loving environment. Mm -hmm. And it's not to say every parent's like that, please, you know, but, you know, you know, we really, we need to take accountability for our actions. And then I feel like society today just wants to put the blame on everybody. It's it's easy for me to blame my mother for, you know, the things that she did or didn't do growing up, but what that's not going to help me in any way. In right. any way. 
I mean, and it was a different time in history. Mm -hmm. like back back when your mom was raising you, it was socially yeah. acceptable to beat your kids. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and if you think about it too, they knew what they know, right? We all yeah. know what we know. So she knew what she knew from what, how she was raised and grown yeah. up. So like you were saying, you know, we have to, at some point, if it is a negative lifestyle that you've been living in, you know, you have to be the one to break that cycle. You know, I have a friend yeah. who's constantly telling me like, you know, my mother, this, my mother, that. And I said, listen, you're a grown adult now. She, she made her mistakes without a doubt. I agree, but you're going to have to be the one now to make the change. You can't expect her to do it anymore. She's, she's, you're a grown adult. <laughs> you have to make that decision. Well, I mean, that kind of goes towards the uh, mental or the victim's mentality, right? Uh, I mean, <laughs> they talked a lot about that at, at the Roger Up event. But that's yes. what I talk all the time about on the podcast is the victim's mentality. Because mm -hmm. um, I feel like at a very young age, I mean, I'm not that old, I'm 29. But uh, at a, at a, in my 20s, I, I realized that, you know, I needed to work through my traumas. Yeah. Thankfully for me. I, I did because I was on like a self-destructive path, you know, because mm -hmm. I hadn't, then who knows where I would be. But um, never once did I really hold anybody else accountable for the things that happened in the past. I had to like look at the future and look at how I wanted to raise my kids. And that's something that I see like with a lot of people, even some of the people that have been on the podcast is they want to hold other people accountable for the things that they had gone through. And it's like, mm -hmm. they, they were wrong for doing that stuff to you. They shouldn't. Have yeah. Done, but like, what are you going to do now? How are you yeah. going to change that pattern? Right. Uh, and listen, I commend you at your age. I wish that I, when I was your age that I was able, that I knew about this, that I, that I understood this whole mental health thing. And about holding accountability and being, you know, being able to be the change. Uh, I think it's definitely more visible now. Um, yeah. because you, do, you know, with social media, it's not all bad. Depends on what you're following. Right. And, yeah. You know, because they have their algorithms all set up. So, you know, I got off of social media completely back in 2020 because that year was just so freaking toxic oh. with, <laughs> you know, oh my God, <laughs> with COVID and with the presidential election. And, uh, you know, I, I was going to hate every one of my friends <laughs> as, if I didn't get off of social media because everybody just felt so comfortable to throw these things out without any accountability of, you know, what? there was like no backing, you know, everybody like with the memes and with the one-liners, it's like, ooh. <laughs> and yeah. I just got literally, I, deleted Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, got off of everything. I said, I, I needed a mental break. And I stayed off it for over a year. How did you feel? Oh, I felt wonderful. I didn't miss it. <laughs> I literally did not miss it. What happened was I did. I, so we, I go to Italy every summer other than 2020 because of COVID. And, uh, you know, social media is the easiest way to stay in touch with your friends from overseas. So back in 2021, I'm like, oh my gosh, I miss my Italy Italian friends so much, like seeing their faces and whatnot. And so I got back on it and I did specifically just travel and lifestyle Instagram page, stayed away from any type of, you know, um, confrontational things. And so that was like peaceful to me. And then I was able to reconnect with my friends. But like I said, you know, I was very cautious as to what I was liking and what was I looking at on social media because I didn't want to get triggered again yeah and I mean you can't avoid it a hundred percent but it's nothing like my old account where I was kind of getting stuck in conversations that I didn't want to be in and now I'm just happy happy <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna keep it that way I just I don't that whole social media that's a whole nother like conversation but it's like I, mm -hmm. I one thing I noticed is that the people that get involved in um like the confrontations going back and forth with either mm -hmm. politics or whatever it is, yeah. whatever, whatever is controversial. Yeah. Uh, they, for one, they have traumas themselves. Mm -hmm. Two, they're people who are bored and don't have anything better to do with their time, right. but to uh -huh. argue with other people. And it's like, this is, this is a huge waste of time for anybody who wants to be productive. That, that's so true. That is, that is so true. And and, and I, I mean, I don't know why they have what the bots, I think they call them or bots that yeah. go on. I don't know what the purpose of creating these bots are. <laughs> like, I mean, it's to create dissent amongst people because I mean, if you yeah. think about it, like if, I mean, they talk about it all the time on different podcasts, but 
if they're like ro Russian bots, like let's say there's an election uh -huh. coming up and the Russians create all these bots. Right. And they start, you know, posting things that are like right wing. And then they have another one that's posting things that are left wing and then uh -huh. they cause dissent. Yeah, and that's the best way to ensure like, uh, like a political swing, I guess, like to swing an election. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what's concerning, you know, in terms of the negativity. Um, when I had, I, I mean, the stuff I post is not controversial at all, so I never really get any stupid comments. But the one I did, and I, I mentioned at one of my <laughs> speaking engagements in Chicago, which I thought was a funny video. <laughs> it was a reel that I did that got like almost a million views from this goofy video my husband and I did, making fun of like living with a teen. Granted, my son does not do half the stuff in this video, but we threw it in there to make it more interesting and fun. Like, you know, like not making his bed properly, keeping the refrigerator open, stealing the chargers, which he does do that. And um, so you know, overall response was very funny. Like, oh my gosh, my kid does that too. But then you get like these people like yelling at me, like, you're such a crappy mother. You should be ashamed of yourself. Get off of social media, learn how to raise your kids. And I'm like, little do they know, my kid is like literally the golden child. <laughs> He's so good. <laughs> and my son's like, mom. He's like, that's what social media is. Like, so I find it concerning that kids growing up in social media think it's the norm that it's okay to go write these like mean things to people. And it, it's one thing to not let it affect you, but it's a whole nother thing when it's like, oh yeah, that's what everybody does. And that concerns me. I mean, it's, I guess it's concerning because your son who's growing up in social media kind of looks mm -hmm. like it's a normal, like it's a normal thing. Like it's just part yeah. of life. And yeah, that is kind of wild that you would do a funny video and somebody would have a negative comment on that. But <laughs> People like people are so crazy and just bored. Like I, yeah. I, I, most most of my interviews on this podcast are pretty positive. I've never really had any negative feedback, mm -hmm. except for like maybe a couple where I've interviewed like a couple politicians, and okay. I've gotten some really bad feedback from those. <laughs> but the thing is, like the people that are like coming at me with negative comments, they mm -hmm. never listen to any other episode I've done. Or I've right. Done. This guy's just doing it for attention. He's just interviewing them for attention. Like, like, do you not see what I'm doing? Like, are you just like disregarding like the hundred plus episodes I've I've put out, except for this one episode? This yeah. one episode defines me as a person. It's just, it's so ridiculous. Well, it's really, uh, and again, my my younger son and, and my older son actually are both really good at this. That that they the opinions of others don't define who they are. Yeah, they are so good with that. And but a majority of people don't think that way listen I still get my feelings hurt sometimes if somebody makes some like rash comment about me but then I have to like go back like it's probably just a 10 year old behind a keyboard or something or on his phone but that's why I feel it's so important to teach emotional intelligence because it's just like really understanding like understanding why you feel certain ways why you respond or react in other ways and developing that toolkit so that when people do come at you or if you have a difficult interview or a difficult coworker, difficult family member i mean the list goes on that you have that mental toolkit to be able to address it in a positive manner it's in you know some people think like well you know you're you're not really like looking at the real issue or you're just pushing it aside. Like, no, I, I do. But there's a time and place for it to say and do everything. And what is most important is, is not to let it affect you as a whole. You know, mm -hmm. I still have my bad days without a doubt, but I definitely am able to flip it a lot quicker than I used to now. I don't hold on to anger like I used to anymore where, you know, where I'll, I'll get angry at something addressed and I'm like, okay, let's move on because Listen, at my age too, I mean, you're old enough to my son. <laughs> um, you really value, you value your time on this earth. You value your life. You value good health, you know, your, your family, because, you know, I'm losing friends already. You, I'm not that old, but still people get sick and, you know, things happen and you, you have to like, just really value your life. So to be, to hold on to this anger and, and be angry at people, like it really pisses me off how the media, because my undergrad, I went to NYU for broadcast journalism and everything that they do that I see on television, which I don't, I, I stopped watching the news after the last election because it was just too much because it's all opinions these days. 
Yeah. And the problem is, you know, everybody is going to go to whatever news news station that agrees with their perspective. You know, nobody, everything's so black and white now. We're, we're not learning to listen to different perspectives. That's really important. Doesn't mean you have to agree with it, but sometimes you have a better understanding of someone when you understand, well, wait a minute, they were raised this way. This is where, you know, they were born. This is, you know, the upbringing they had, the community they had, the school they went to, the people that surrounded them. It's gonna be a lot different from what you had. And we can't expect everybody to think the same exact way. And I feel like we're losing, we're losing that open communication and you know back in the 80s you know the politicians were able to work together and it's like okay you know what we disagree but listen you know we could do this on your side we'll do this on they, they negotiated they worked find up found a way to work together you know it, all in all but it's not like that anymore and everybody just wants to like freaking attack each other on, on both sides yeah. <laughs> they just want to constantly attack each other and I, I've never in my life seen, or like when I was a teenager in middle school, I didn't care about politics. Holy cow. Like, you know, I, these 12 year olds are like talking about politics now. I'm like, why? No, go play with your dolls or something. Well, I, I think a lot of it has to do with also the educational system and the way mm -hmm. the, the educational system's promoting the things that are going on, which, you know, it's, it's not a bad thing to have kids know like what's going on in the world. Right. It, it is a bad thing when, when it's a certain narrative that's being painted and mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I actually have a guest coming on this weekend who is a, a lawyer who uh, she, she fights schools in court all the time. Really? Yeah. He's going to come on and talk about a lot of the things that the schools are doing and whatnot. So that'll be interesting. But um one, one question I wanted to ask you is you, you go around and you do um, motivational speech speeches, uh -huh. like, essentially. I hate that word for motivation. I know. It's like, yeah. <laughs> so like, like, it's kind of like woo woo in a sense. Like, I know. I don't know. I just don't like that word, but you're essentially a motivational speaker. Yeah. Um, what is the feedback like whenever you, you're teaching emotional intelligence? Um, is it mainly positive? Or do yes. You, you and you know what? In it? The most positivity I get is when I do college colleges with college students. Wow. They really thrive on it, and I think because I do get personal, and and, and they get they have fun. I'm I'm good at connecting with younger people, and so they always appreciate it. And I mean, the Roger Up event was totally different for me because it was male based, and I I, I talked about the whole imposter syndrome thing <laughs> because whoa, <laughs> like I. <laughs> was not used to that I, my audience has always been colleges universities and female base and so you know it was a big challenge for me to, to be with all these male speakers and, and male audience and now that i've done I'm like oh wow that was cool i really did enjoy it. i mean god I, i've like made some like lifelong friends out of that event which was totally yeah. cool but um overall with emotional intelligence like listen emotional intelligence has been around forever it, it, it's just that they slapped a label on it back in the nineties. And it, it's even like, you know, and if you, some, you know, I, I think I, I have a very strong faith. So a lot of it, I don't want to say it's religion based, but a lot of the good things that the Bible's teaching is basically, you know, like be good to other people, yeah. you know, be understanding, be compassionate, be forgiving. And that's what I'm trying to relay to people and just explain to them, give them different opportunities and and ways to see because like with every negative aspect there's something to learn from it and fear like uh, that fear-based mindset thing just drives me like the victim mindset drives me crazy but the fear-based mindset used to like for me would cripple me on so many things in life I mean I definitely probably still am an introvert but I just ne learned how to manage it a lot better um how do you I manage it What's that? How do you manage it? Because I know a lot of people that like with a lot, what they, they're introverts and they allow uh -huh. that to kind of cripple the way they like interact or like even like people who want to come on this podcast, they're, yep. they're like, I'm an introvert. I don't want to, I don't like talking. And so they 100% just face my fear. Just walk right into it. Just do so it. yeah, just do it. Just, and I do that with everything now. 
And, and now it's like, if I'm afraid of something, I'm like, oh yeah, cool, bring it on. You know, it's like challenging and exciting to me because you have to remember, you know, when you have anxiety over something, it's the same exact chemical components of being excited about something. So it's literally just switching that word in your head. And instead of saying, oh my gosh, I'm anxious and nervous. No, I'm excited. And I'll tell myself, I'm excited, I'm excited, I'm excited. And when my husband and I first met, and we've been together 20 plus years, but he would make a, he used to call me shy girl all the time. He's like, oh, you're so shy. You're so shy. And now he's, I, he probably wishes I still was, <laughs> but <laughs> at the, you know, like I'll be like, oh, order a pizza. And I'm like, no, I, I couldn't even pick up the phone to order a pizza. That is how fearful I was. And part of me, I had to kind of go back and look as to why I, why was I so shy? I mean, yeah, you know, some people say you're born with it, but looking back, there were certain instances in school where I was belittled by the teacher for giving a wrong answer. You know, the eighties was a lot different. <laughs> the teachers <laughs> than they are now. And I, I mean, we kind of swung too far in the other direction, but I remember just like feeling humiliated. So from that, it was like, I just didn't want to speak. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want any attention on myself whatsoever. But as I got older, I didn't, you know, I didn't like, like I would see other people that were more outgoing and, and have fun and, and I wanted more of that in me. So when I went to college, I made myself, I took public speaking courses. I took um, acting. I took an acting course. Be I, no desire to be an actor, but I did it to face the fear of being out there in the spotlight. And funny story, when I was at NYU, my girlfriend and I, who was also super shy, we had to take an elective, a summer elective, to so we could graduate in time. So we took this class called What's So Funny About New York. Either they didn't write it in the description what the class actually was, or we just completely ignored it because it fit our schedules were like, oh, let's take this course. It was a comedy course. It was like how to be a comic, wow. okay? And I remember sitting in class the first day like, oh my gosh. And we're looking at we're like, what, the, what did we get ourselves into? How to be a comic. They, we literally had to go do stand-up comedy in a New York club wow. for our final. That's awesome. And, and, but we did it. We stuck it through and they, they taught us how to do it. It's like storytelling, which is almost like kind of the same as, you know, when I get up and speak, a lot of it is you're bringing in your own personal experiences. And if you look at comics, that all, that's all they're doing is storytelling. It's just a delivery and their body language that makes it funny. So through those, now, even after all that, I still was shy because I met my husband after <laughs> all of this, but you get to a point where you have to like make it again, accountability of your own life where you're kind of like, well, what do I want to do with myself? So I just started facing, if you started putting myself in positions to be more in the public eye, I mean, I was a journalism and I brought broadcast journalism. I had to do the news. Like when I went to NYU, we had like, you know, the college news where it's like a real TV station type of thing. So that was okay for me because it was scripted, but you know, later in life, I just learned to get better and better and a practice better and better and better at it. And then once I learned about emotional intelligence, my mentor at the time was like, you really should start speaking. And I'm like, are you crazy? <laughs> She's like, no, you really should. So I just started like putting myself out there doing little things here and there. And then opportunities started coming and I just kept on I'm like, and I found that I enjoyed it more so because so like when you initially asked about, you know, what's my feedback and response that people or either wanting it or needing it, enjoying it. I mean, I'll have people come up to me afterwards and share me extremely personal situations that they were going through after just listening to me speak for a half hour, an hour, whatever it was. So I found that what I was doing was a good thing. And it was able to reach people and able to help them in certain ways. And I'm, I'm a very open person where I'm always willing to talk and you know, build relationships. I'm a really good relationship builder with people. So I've made through this process a lot of good friends as well. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's really awesome. So, <laughs> so to go back a little bit, yeah, would, would you ever do stand-up comedy? No, because oh. <laughs> <laughs> they're mean. The people are. Mean <laughs> you got to not care what other people think. No, no, I'm not a comic. <laughs> and it's funny because, um, com I mean, I, I like clean comedy and. I'm not going to mention the comic's name because he's really famous right now, but my son, my older son was, is like a big fan. So he was performing this past summer 
And I bought tickets for my husband for his birth. I'm like, oh, let's go see this comic. Joey loves him, blah, blah, blah. And I've seen little bits here and there, like online, which I thought were funny. But no, his comedy was not mine. And it was so funny because during it, me and my husband were just looking at each other like, People were like cracking up. It was a sold out show. Everybody was like laughing. I'm like, oh my God, they find this stuff funny. It was like, a lot of it was, was sexual things, but with like family. And it was very like uncomfortable, sexual taboo type of stuff. And afterwards I'm like, oh my God, he's got trauma. I need to talk to him. Like that boy's got <laughs> trauma like that he hasn't healed from. <laughs> because He's like putting it out in his show. And I bought a, before the show, I bought one of those like concert shirts with his name on it. And I'm like, Lou, I tell my husband, Lou, I'm like, I can't wear this because that was just a really uncomfortable show. So I gave it to my son's wife because she liked the comic. I'm like, here, you can have it because I can't wear this thing. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, I mean, that that's the thing about uh, comedians. Most of them have like extreme trauma and that's kind of what makes them funny. That's kind of what yeah. makes them them. It's the way, it's their way of healing. Yeah. You know? so God bless them to heal and make all that money too while they're doing it. <laughs> And make people laugh, right? So it's yeah. kind of a good little combination there. Yeah, I mean, most of them, though, you know, e even though they they're successful, like they still are not happy, you know. Yeah. I mean, we we've seen the stories over and over of the people who've committed suicide because of you know they just yeah couldn't get through whatever it was that you know. Was... It's hard. They they know how to mask their pain yeah. really well. And that's why, you know, it's important for anybody to like some of the happiest people. I've had two friends that committed suicide would never have thought, never have thought because they were like the happy, fun, you know, fun guys that was just always on the outside. They just were really outgoing and fun. And so to hear when when both of them did that at separate times, it, it's like, wow, like, how did I miss that? Yeah. Yeah, it's. It, it's it's scary and you know especially yeah. because, like a friend of them you know mm -hmm. yeah because like if you see somebody who's depressed then you know they're depressed and they're in pain right, right. You know, so it's a whole nother like it's almost better that way because then you could kind of offer them help and be there for them but if they're not if they're hiding it it's a lot harder to notice yeah absolutely mm -hmm. so you have an event coming up um around yeah. Christmas time. <laughs> yes <laughs> I'm so excited about this event. So, so tell, me, tell me a little bit more about the event. You you obviously kind of uh, mm -hmm. you 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 uh, specialize more with women. Um, mm -hmm. you want yeah. to, be able to help women, professional women. I think yes. we were talking a little bit about this before I started or before I hit record. So yes. Right. <laughs> so, so back in 2020, whenever you know when we were like in lockdown and whatnot, I, I was doing I started like doing different um, online courses for my field because. You know, even though I I feel that I'm a master of my field, I still constantly, constantly like talk to mentors, read books. I even reread books over and over again because I'm always grabbing something new to keep myself fresh. And I took two courses from two separate Ivy League universities, actually, online to, you know, strengthen it. One was strictly on just emotional intelligence and the other one was on women in leadership. And because I do do corporate speaking engagements as well. Obviously that's a really good field for me. And what I found was the courses that I've taken, and even when I was in college, I had taken different courses with women as, regarding women as well, is that they, I wasn't getting what I needed. They, they do, and mm, if anybody ever takes this course, I bet it save your money because <laughs> it, it was pretty much man bashing and it pissed me off. And I'm like, this is not helping women at all. You guys are going backwards. Why is it that when I took a course 20 years ago in college, you're still teaching, still playing that victim mindset 20 years later? And it really bothered me. And I wanted to make a change. And then in the same respect, too, down, I do a lot of nonprofit work down here. I live in South Jersey. And so I used to belong to this one group. For, so for five years, I helped them do a big um, nonprofit engagement, which was called, I don't want to say the name, <laughs> but, but it was all, God forbid they see this and they're local, <laughs> but it was all women. And the problem here was it would be this massive event that we would have. 
that would have 250 women here and then we would have we would pay tens of thousands of dollars for a celebrity to come in to speak and it was supposed to motivate women half of the time they had men come to speak i'm like well why are we hiring men if we're supposed to be bringing women together and then second of all other times where we did have these women speak we did have a couple of great motivational, you know, inspiring ones that I felt I got something, but a lot of it was just fluff. You know, um, I get that the mindset is, well, if I hire a celebrity, more people will be interested in coming. Unfortunately, that's true. Yet I have seen so many more inspiring speakers that are not celebrities. I mean, look at, you know, Roger up, you know, a lot of these great guys here, we don't know them in the celebrity aspect, but man, they have incredible messages and tools that can really help society. So I was getting frustrated with the fact that here's all these women paying all this money to go to these like women speaking events and we're really getting nothing out of it. It was just total fluff. Like, oh, you know, what do you like to cook? And what do you do on date night? Like, what? <laughs> I don't care about that stuff. You know, tell me, give me something of substance. So Slap me around 20, for a minute. <laughs> what, what's that? Slap me around for a minute and tell me what I'm doing wrong and how I need to sw change my life up. <laughs> right. And so back in, and I even like suggested it to the organizer, like, hey, listen, you know what? There's these really great female speakers I know that will actually make a great impact for these women. But they're like, no, we don't want to go that route. You know, they wanted to stick with the celebrity route. I'm like, all right, no, no problem. You know, it's your event. I'm just a volunteer. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to start my own. So I did it at my house in 2020 because first of all, after lockdown, people just wanted to get out. Okay. And be seeing each other face to face. I yeah. tried doing a few of these virtual events. It just wasn't working for me. I, I don't like being a speaker to a group of people on the computer or yeah. on the receiving. It just That's didn't, you know, that when you're there in person, you get that energy, that human interaction that you could feel people, you could see them yeah. and connect with them on a much better basis without a doubt. So I said, all right, I'm going to have one in my backyard because I have a nice big backyard. And I had this event and I funded it by myself, 100%. I said, all right, you know what? I'm going to invite 50 women. And as I was going through my list of people to invite, I realized like 75% of these people, these women were entrepreneurs. They were business leaders. They were leaders of their community. They held high ranking titles. So I'm like, well, wait a minute, you know, you watch media and they think like us poor women are like these victims that are, oh my God, like overrun by these guys and we can't stand up for themselves. I'm like, this is not true at all. No, like here, these are, this is just my small little circle and I have all these women. So I, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to highlight these women. So I actually, that year I chose the woman who mentored me that got me into speaking and, and because she just had a book release. And unfortunately for her, releasing a book during COVID was like the worst time because all her speaking, you know, book tour, her whole book tour got canceled because wow. they weren't doing in-person events. So I did this event with her in my backyard and it was really fun because, because of the fact that we were just getting out of lockdown, you know, every, the women were all dressed up, you know, they had on their high heels, all done up. People were just happy to get out of their sweats yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> And be able to engage one-on-one -on -one in person. And it was really successful. So the, I'm like, you know what? I'll do this again. So the following year, last summer, I did it again. And I highlighted, she is actually, she was a QVC model for 25 years, but she owns her own construction business. Wow. So, and you look at this like beautiful, like six foot tall, gorgeous model. And she's out working every day with a hammer, like literally like building homes. That's so, awesome. so I highlighted her, you know, who she was and she's a black female too. So, you know, because she was like kind of pissed off with all this whole, you know, racist thing. She's like, no, she, like her neighbor went to her house and like had like that whole, um, white guilt thing and like apologize to her for you know having all these you know not being like being white basically <laughs> <laughs> and went on on and on like apologizing to my girlfriend and my girlfriend sat there and listened and she's like sweetheart I don't know what you're talking about but everything I have I built on my own and you don't have white privilege she told her she's like because 
I didn't need your permission to do what I'm doing and to build my business. So I love that part of her. And she shared that with all the women that came to my home that year. And so that one got a little bigger and it was like a whole, each year is getting better. So this past summer, I didn't do it because I was traveling a lot this summer. I was in Italy again and a couple other states I was applying to. And, but people started reaching out to me. Inez, Inez, are you doing it again? Are you doing it again? I'm like, oh gosh, or, you know, I'm like, or, you know, it takes, costs a lot of money and I'm paying for the whole thing. But I'm like, you know what? People want it. I'll do it. So I'm like, you know what? I'll do it as a Christmas theme because years ago I used to have this whole girl Christmas party at my house where we dressed up as like in our cute little Santa outfits and me had a really good time. So I ended up saying, you know what? I'm going to do my event again this year. And I named it, I renamed it to core because, you know, I talk about core strategies in my speeches a lot. So I call it core women's network and I'm having it the Christmas theme where the girls are going to come dressed up and you know, have fun. And my son started a club at school called Hermits Helping Homeless. And Hermits is their mascot at school. So he got approved to start this club at school because down by us in Atlantic City, the homeless population is pretty bad. And there's a nonprofit group called Angels in Motion that my girlfriend Lisa B runs, where she's literally out there every single Wednesday feeding the homeless. And she's gotten the whole community together where people are constantly donating sandwiches, not just peanut butter jelly. I mean, they're donating like really good food to them. Wait, 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 wait. Somebody was talking crap about your son starting this club? Yes, that's the club they were he was talking crap about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so I told my son, listen, I'll help you out. I will combine my event. So like, we're going to collaborate, right? We're, we're going to have a collaboration. So where I'm having my women speak event. So where I'm having Angels in Motion highlighted as our event with Lisa B, who is, you know, she's a great female leader. She's out there being out there. Like go Atlantic City is not safe at all, but she is there every Wednesday out there feeding the homeless people. She's wow. the drug dealers, the, the gangs, they know who she is. They leave her alone. It's like, they know, like she just goes in there, feeds the homeless and leaves. And they kind of like, they're like, don't mess with us and we won't mess with you type of thing. Wow. She's been doing it for a couple of years now. Can you put me in contact with her? Absolutely. Absolutely. She's such a great woman. And unfortunately she, I mean, I'll let you tell, she'll let you, um, her tell your, her story, but her, 20 oh her son who was in his 20s he like overdosed and died oh. and then her husband just recently died of cancer so oh. she's going through these really difficult things and yet wow she has such a giving heart and i'm like who better to highlight at my event you know my women's event and you know the organization's organization it's not her organization she just kind of runs the atlantic city division it's called angels in motion so i'm thinking christmas angels so every so i same thing. I'm handpicking. I'm inviting 50 women. It's a by invitation only event simply because I fund it. Um, and every this year, I'm asking every single woman to bring a blanket to donate because Lisa has told me that the homeless, it gets super cold down here in the 20s, that they don't have enough blankets. And she said, like, last year, last winter was awful. So she's like, I could really use a big blanket donation. I'm like, no problem. We'll take care of it. So my son's going to, like, you know, at his club, get kids to come donate. You know, they're making sandwiches. They're donating the blankets. They're like writing handwriting cards to the homeless to let these people know that they care because they're people too. Yeah. You know, and Lisa will share like who these homeless people are, how they got in their predicaments. And, and there's a lot of sad stories, but it's our way of like giving back my way of having my event. And then because it's my third year, local businesses are kind of catching on with what I'm doing. So I've, got, I've gotten all these sponsors now. And I'm like, this is really cool. Like people are, you know, I have a local restaurant that's donating the food to my event. Another business is going to donate all the wine to my event. I have gift bags for all the um, attendees that everything's like donated. And, do you know, um, I'm sure you, that guy, Bedros, Be Koulian, Koulian. He's, uh, sounds he's, all right all, all the so i learned about who he was through the roger up from all the, like the navy seal guys because they know him okay well his wife owns that um company it's called true leans nutrition thing okay and they had the um when we were in the uh, were you at the auditorium the 
AMC movie theater event? I, no, I wasn't. Oh. Yeah, okay. Well, they had these shaker bottles to for all the attendees. It was like they did, were donated. So I reached out to Pedro. <laughs> and I'm like, wow. hey, <laughs> I'm having this event. And he's like, wait, you're friends with Jason Redman. I, I'm good friends with him. So from there, we kind of like struck up a conversation. I told him what I'm doing with this event. And a week later, he sent me like cases of these like samples and shaker bottles to give wow. for the gift bags. And it was like so sweet and generous of him. And his wife owns the company, Truline. So I'm definitely going to you know, give them the exposure they deserve. But then other local businesses have been giving, you know, and, and a lot of times they're like, I just ask and now I, I just, ask, and right away, it's like, absolutely. What do you need? What do you need? Wow. So it's also a lesson for my son too. You know, like, don't be afraid to ask for things, especially when you're doing something good for yeah. people. And, you know, we live, we're very, we have a very blessed life. You know, we, we live, we have an abundant lifestyle and we're very thankful for it, but it's also really important to give back to the community, which he does with no problem. And he's the one that wanted to start this club. I'm really proud of him. Him and his best friend are like doing it together. And he's really like, it's so cute. They had this whole like business plan that they mapped out for the whole year as to like what their goals are each month for what, how much they want to raise money wise, how many sandwiches they want to make, how many things, you know, items like blankets and um, coats and stuff like that to get donated. So he's also learning kind of like almost running a business too. So there's like a lot of different little lessons within this project. And then he gets to work with mom. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have two magazines that are coming. The publishers, I told the, the publishers are men and it's so funny i told them i'm having this all women event i would love to get some media coverage and you know you, you'll probably be the only two guys here and they're like no problem <laughs> 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 i got uh, a new jersey lifestyle magazine coming and then millennium magazine which is who i write for even though he's out of new york he's going to come down down my way and put it in the magazine as well so we're now getting press coverage for my event which is pretty exciting That's and i'm looking to eventually just grow this i kind of like it that so you see i'm kind of torn because i like it that it's only 50 women right and yeah you think only 50 50 is actually a lot when they're all together especially in your house <laughs> in my house right but i you know i want to encourage these women to get to actually talk to each other, build relationships of their own and help each other out. Like I made a whole contact list with everybody's names and emails and what business do they have? Because I encourage each other to support each other's small businesses as well. Yeah. And, but you know, my, my dream, my goal is to like make this into a bigger event, which will have to be out of my house, unfortunately, <laughs> but, but provide that same value, you know, where, where the girls and the women that come can really walk away with something of value, walk away with a new friendship, a new contact, skill sets, knowing that they're not alone, knowing that we have trauma. You know, I, I talk when I talk to the college kids and I I'd like to start out by having them you know visualize. I always say, listen, visualize two people. I'm gonna describe two people to you. And we all have, you know, our, our thoughts and judgments of people. So I say, you know, there's this one person, you know, she is 19 years old. She's a college dropout. She's a single mom. She's on welfare and you know, she's trying to make ends meet. And then you have another woman who, you know, has graduate, who has multiple degrees and um, whose son went to Ivy league and does well financially. And I said, you know, picture these two women in your head and what are your thoughts about each of them? And I said, all right, well, guess what? They're both the same person because I'm talking about myself, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I want people to know, you know, a lot of people, you, you, you get a stigma like, oh, you're on welfare. Yeah, I was on welfare. I used it for a year to, I didn't like live off of welfare, but the ability of it the, was there for me to help me. And people, unfortunately today, take advantage of these government systems that are supposed to help us and I kind of feel in a way maybe the government wants to keep people down there but I wasn't going to be just another statistic you know th that that wasn't happening because I had my son I love that you said that I love that you said that I'm, I didn't want to be another statistic because that, no. that was one of the defining factors of me starting this podcast is like mm -hmm. I I was told that I'm going to be a statistic and I wanted to prove <laughs> to everybody that I wasn't going to be and so yeah. I started the podcast to help share my story. And I wanted to talk to other people who also didn't want to be a statistic who overcame all the traumas and everything that they had gone through. Right. And I think the more people, you know, like, you know, people like you that are putting this out there, 
you're you're going to reach somebody, you know, because obviously somebody reached me to know that, hey, you know what, I am better than what everybody says. Because, you know, when you're a 19 single mom on welfare and trying to make ends meet, people will judge you. They will judge you. And, oh, you know, you're never going to make anything out of yourself. And But my love for my son, and I don't, you know, I can't pinpoint exactly why I had such a strong desire to like not be that statistic at a young age. And, and of course, you know, I had other traumas I had to deal with. However, at that time, you know, looking at my child, I wanted to provide for him a, a good life. And, you know, I, I'm a minority woman and that's what like gets me upset too when I see what's happening in the world. Like they want to, they want to give us like all these to make things easier for us. Oh, well, you're Hispanic and you're a female and like, you can't, I don't like the fact that it kind of feel like you can't do it on your own. So let us just like kind of do it for you. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. that, that, uh, when I was in, when my first year in college, before I dropped out, I had a full ride. I had a full four year scholarship, but because I had all these other issues and traumas in my life, which led me to get pregnant and, you know, have my son at a young age and I ended up dropping out of college. When things are given to you, you don't appreciate it as much, you know, and when I went back to college and listen, uh, I do pray <laughs> at the rising cost of college tuition now that my son does get good scholarship money. But at the time and my immaturity at the time and not being grateful for what I had, you know, I, I let it slip out of my fingers where I ended up paying like massive amounts of money to ended up years later going back to college on my own. And I think it's really important that we teach our kids and adults too, unfortunately, you know, like, I feel like let's teach the kids now so they don't become big screw ups or we have to fix them later on when we're 40 years old, you know, these skill sets and be accountable for your actions. And it's okay because I, I tell my son all the time, Mateo, you're going to fail. Just know it. You're going to fail. The key is how are you going to deal with that failure? You know, he, he is very bright. You know, he is a star varsity rower at his school. He gets straight A's. He's in all like the highest level courses in school he can be in. Very driven, very academic and athletic. But he's going to still fail. And I prefer him to fail now <laughs> because I want him to be able to learn at a younger age how to deal with those failures well, than when you're older. And it's, I mean, failure is really just a mindset because mm -hmm. even though, even though something doesn't work out, whether it's like a business venture or whatever right. it is, it's not necessarily failure until you give up and you stop trying. True. And it's just a learning lesson is all. Yeah. And I think it's, I think that's a message that we really need to get out there. And I wish they would focus more on that in school. Like none of it, you know, we, we pay all this money for my son to go to this private all boys Catholic school and they don't teach mindset. They don't teach mental health. And I've addressed it you know, to the head of school. Well, why don't you, you know, listen, I'm not worried about my son because he's taken care of, but uh, I see all these other kids and how they're acting out. And I'm like, we, we need to teach that because if they have that mental toolkit at a young age, they are going to be more successful in their careers, in their relationships, in their own individual well-being, you know, in their spiritual life, whatever it may be. If you have that at a young age, it's going to be a lot more easier for you to navigate life. Will you face challenges? Without a doubt, of course. But you'll be able to get out of those challenges quicker or be able to find a way to learn from your failures in a positive way. I completely agree with that. I mean, it, it kind of goes to show too, like looking back at some of the people that I went to school with and mm -hmm. kind of like, I remember like in school looking at these people like, wow, they have like a good life. Like their parents have good jobs. They're obviously pretty well to do, but then mm -hmm. now you see them and it's like, they have, you know, several kids by different people, which whatever, but then, mm -hmm. but then they're like on only, only fans. And I'm like, what? Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I just learned what that was like a week ago. Too. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness <laughs> well like, it, yeah it's this is a constant conversation with uh, a couple of coworkers because like a couple of the guys I work with I went to school with and mm -hmm. we were in the same grade and everything so we constantly are talking about people that we went to school with and like what they're up yeah. to and it's like man like if they had these type of skills when they were younger like maybe they wouldn't be seeking some of the attention they're seeking or maybe oh without a doubt 
or maybe they wouldn't be, um, they'd be more confident in who they are and maybe they would own a business or maybe they would be doing this or that. It's just, it, it's definitely something that needs to be taught in schools. Well, I feel, listen, it, it, in the grand scheme of things, everybody just wants to feel love, right? They want to feel, that's, that's why social media is so popular with the likes. You know, they feel like, oh, if I get, I mean, people go and buy likes. And it's like, yeah. you as the person buying these likes or followers, whatever it may be, you know, it's not real. But yet the person's feeling better looking at these numbers rise. And even if you're not buying likes and you're getting these followers, like, but they're strangers. Yeah. And you really need to learn how to just be confident with who you are as a person. And because otherwise you're going to constantly just work and do things and you might like you said like the only fans things you might be doing things that's gonna hurt your life in the future i mean god i mean you have kids and you're on only fans that's a little bit disturbing because <laughs> 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 I mean, eventually they're gonna find out about it it's like what are you doing <laughs> well and, and you know what and, and going back to like when you were talking about you know knowing families who are wealthy and whatnot um you know my husband he does very well he, he he's well to do but so we, we came to the challenge of finding that balance with our kids. Like we want to, you know, I grew up very poor as my husband. We both grew up very, very like poverty stricken. And when he saw the old house that I grew up in, he's like, damn, I thought I was poor. You were really poor. <laughs> but you know what? He really like built his business. Like he, I, I wish he would get into public speaking because he is a phenomenal speaker and he's in terms of business. And he's so great at, telling his story on how he like lost everything but then that kind of set that fire in him right you're saying it's like it's not failure unless you give up yeah you know, the outside world looked like wow you're a big failure but he like that just drove him like i never want to be in this position again and he built this incredibly successful uh, business and so having kids who are growing up in this more posh lifestyle, you know, with like the nice cars and the nice house and, you know, we travel very well. I love the fact we were able to travel with them since birth because it gave them a whole new perspective of seeing people in other parts of the world, trying different foods, learning different cultures, learning, learning different behaviors behaviors having patience with people who are different with you you know so they're the two of them are excellent excellent you know have great people skills which i'm really proud of but we came to that difficulty of well you know what we can't just give them everything because then they needed to understand the money that we had was money that we earned they don't just get it because they happen to be our kids yeah. and we had to really figure out how to do that so with my older son when he turned 17 and it was time to get a car i'm like all right well the deal was you know you save your money and whatever you save will match he saved nothing he just assumed and he went to the so he went to the same school that the younger one that Mateo goes to now, which is, you know, he, you go to school and you see these kids with Mercedes and BMWs and all these crazy like Lexuses and now the Teslas. <laughs> so he just assumed like, well, I'm going to get a car. And I'm like, no, you're not. you like, you didn't do your part. And we thought we had a great, you know, what we were doing was very fair. We weren't saying buy it yourself, but we're like, you know, you got to take accountability too. So he didn't get a car until he was like 21 years old. Wow. And we, and you know what? Even friends were like, you guys are so mean. I'm like, why? I, I don't believe we're being mean. We're, we're teaching him a lesson. And it. I'll tell you what, it was hard in the same respect because we had the money to buy him a car and you want him to be able to enjoy you know, life. But, but what good is it? What good is, what are we doing to him if we just go back on our word and, and do that? And now... And, and you know that's just like one of many life lessons that we taught him as he got older. But now he's extremely successful all on his own. He did it all on his own. You know, he he's married, he paid for his own wedding. You know, he 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 moved down to Florida and he has a great job now that he enjoys. So we look back like, whoa, okay, you know what? We had those rough years, but we taught him the skill set. We didn't just give him what he wanted. We taught him about accountability, being taken, you know, responsibility for what you do in life. And it worked out. And the best compliment I could ever get is when he like came up to us and he was like, you know what? I didn't like you guys <laughs> when I was in high school. <laughs> he goes, but now that I'm an adult looking back, 
I, when I have kids, I want to raise them exactly how you raise me. Wow. And it, and it's like, oh, <laughs> <You know? laughs> now the little one, he turns 17 in a few weeks. My child's a saver. He saved 20 grand for his car. Wow. <laughs> you know, he had his little side businesses that he would do. He used to, he made his own, like, um, I don't know, you're probably familiar, like buying and reselling sneakers and. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a little, I, I don't know. I don't get that whole thing, but. I, I, I can't the, believe the prices that some of these people will pay for these. There, there's a guy I work with who mm -hmm. he's a rapper. Um, okay. He's actually a pretty big rapper. Mm -hmm. uh, his name's Sway Boy, and he has like a whole room dedicated to shoes. Wow. And I'm just yeah. like, what? Like his shoes are worth more than my house. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. This is crazy. But you know what? My My younger one made a lot of money doing it. You know, yeah. and plus, like every birthday check and you know confirmation check you got, he's just saved every penny. And oh, so, that's smart. you know, now he's he'll have a car when he you know when he turns seventeen in a few weeks. So, <laughs> it, it it's nice to see that the hard work that you put in, even though trust me, I've questioned myself a lot. Like, oh my gosh, am I like you know taking opportunity away from them? And because like even with the older one, he. His freshman year in college, it was his first, you know, my first time having a child go away to school, his first taste of freedom. And, but I was like, kind of always hovering him, like texting him, are you studying? <laughs> are you doing all your work? And he's in college and he'll like text me pictures back with like him and 10 girls. I'm like, yeah, mom, I'm studying. And I'm like, dude. <laughs> and he had a partial scholarship going to school, but his freshman year, he failed math and got like a D in science. And those were literally his two strongest subjects, which showed me that he put zero effort in and he was on academic probation and broke my heart. And I said, listen, if you lose that scholarship, I'm not paying the difference. You will move back home and you will go to the community school. And that's the way it is. And my parents had a field day like, are you crazy? Why would you do that? I'm like, because he needs to learn a lesson. And I, and he was like, no, he's like, he's like, ah, what am I supposed to do? I'm like, you know what? Go find a tutor, go, go speak to the teacher. Do you figure it out? You know, I said, I want you to have fun, but you needed to learn how to balance it. And you know what? He, he ended up getting straight A's after that and saved his scholarship. Wow. So, you know, so I don't like calling it tough love. I call it, like, it's, it's more like reality. You know, we, we need, there's too many helicopter parents out there. You know, I get it. We want to save our children you know, from the difficulties of life, but they're never going away and, and let them face it when they're younger. So when they're adults, they can actually learn how to manage it. Yeah. And, and it allows them to have a greater appreciation for things too. Like with mm -hmm. I mean, talking about your, your son having to chip in half the money for a car. Right. He will appreciate that car so much more. Yeah. He put his own money, his own hard work and blood, sweat and tears into it also. Mm hmm. Yeah. And we see and I get irritated when people look at my look at Mateo when he does well, because I see how hard he works. I see the studying that he does. He'll be up till midnight just studying and practicing and doing what he needs to do. He's very responsible. And then I'll get a teacher that will be like, oh, yeah, it just comes easy to him. Like, no, no, it doesn't. I, I, I do you want me to videotape and show you what he looks like at midnight? I'm like that. That You shouldn't you, you shouldn't say that. I, that makes that pisses me off <laughs> <laughs> and i'm very vocal with but, the school sometimes I mean, in a respectful way <laughs> i think it's easy to dismiss somebody like that too like oh well he's yeah. just naturally a genius or whatever you know oh. and okay. you know what but then that when you say that too then it puts makes other people feel like you know oh i can't do it because i wasn't born that way that's so not true right. we all have the ability to do it you know, we don't have the ability, to, like I can never, I can play basketball all I want. I'll never be a basketball player. But each of us have talents and abilities where we can be successful in a chosen field, but most importantly, be successful as a human being. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I try. <laughs> I, had a, I recently had a friend of mine that I went to school with. We can wrap this up soon. Um, we've been going for a while, but I recently had a friend on and that's one thing he was talking about because in school he was the smart kid he was a kid that always mm -hmm. had good grades um but then on the podcast he he came on and he was talking about how 
yeah, he's like, I would stay up till two or three in the morning. And that's what a lot of people didn't see. People didn't yeah. see him putting in the work, even though he was mm -hmm. getting these good grades, like he worked hard for that. And so like, we were kind of having that conversation, the same conversation. Like, I just assumed like he was just a born right. natural, like, like, <laughs> you know, expert in math. <laughs> Right. Well, my kids are good in math, though. <laughs> and it's funny because I, I'm half Chinese and half Puerto Rican. So even my husband will joke around like, yeah, it's because they're half Asian. <laughs> like, no, you see how hard he's like studying and working. And, and guess what? I my the younger one, he's a junior right now. He's doing like some AP calculus class. And I'm like, my oh. senior year, I was not doing calculus. I was like, no, I'm done. <laughs> that's Which I'm glad that's I awesome. Him. It's yeah. awesome that your kids have picked up on the the things that you have learned and that you have taught them and that they're actively implementing them in, in their life because well, yes, essentially it's just going to create for a better generation when, when people like, like you teach their kids, those kind of things. And then they mm -hmm. implementing them in their life and their friends see it and so on and so forth. And we have to be really aware with our own actions because listen, we could tell them everything we want. It's the actions is what we're doing every day. That sees it you know, where they actually learn, you know, they, they see, um, you know, one thing about both of my sons is that they're, they're very strong. Like they're very protective nature. Like I, I loved, um, Byron Rogers from the event. <laughs> yeah, he's so like, <laughs> you know, like that man's fan. I think a lot of, there's a lot of man crushes going on with him. <laughs> um, but I was just in love with his arms. They were here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, in that respect, like both of my boys, so they're both, you know, they have Sicilian blood in them and they're definitely like, they, they are like tough when needed to be because overall they're both also very kind and caring and compassionate, you know, young, one's a man, one's a young man. So that makes me feel good. Like my daughter-in-law, you know, recently sent me a text, like just how wonderful her joey my son is and as a mother to receive that you know from your son's wife is like you know like it brought tears to my eyes and she's you know she wrote she's like clearly it's a reflection of the love you know and how you raise him and i understand you were a single mom for the first seven years of his life so it was obviously very difficult but you know you guys got through it so <sighs> people look at me now and they think like, oh, she's so put together. She's, you know, she got, she has everything going on. She's got these great vacations, home, lifestyle, great kids, great husband. But it wasn't always like that, you know? And, you know, even when I was first married, it wasn't like that because I just didn't feel good about myself because I didn't face my traumas until well into my marriage. And if I didn't, you know, would I be married now? So who knows, you know, because I was lashing out on my husband. But, you know, I am like, prime example that anybody can change their life around anybody can you just have to want it and you got to put the work into it and you have to be very aware of who you're spending your time with how you're spending your time especially on social media you know don't follow that crap and all those controversy things and get a mentor I mean even to this day I still have a mentor I read I am an avid reader I read three to four books a month. You know, usually it's like two new books and two rereads of other great books that I love that I really got a lot out of. And that's what keeps me fresh because honestly, if I stop, yeah, I'll, I'll slip just like anybody else. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's one thing that I've started doing since the Roger up event is, is mm -hmm. re reading almost every single day. And I'm yeah. not reading like one book. I, I'll read like a book in the morning and then before bed I'll read another book and I actually have been reading the, the Roger Up book which has been oh, like, cool. huge, like a huge motivator for me like before I go to bed I'm like mm -hmm. I'm gonna get up in the morning and get after it so I, I, I do the same thing in the morning <laughs> I'm reading Atomic Habits right now which is a reread it's probably like my fourth or fifth time reading it because and um then my nighttime book is Eat Smarter because listen I got every other aspect of my life going on good but that freaking eating part <laughs> it still haunts me i am a sugar oh. addict and it's something that i need to really break yeah i but, i'm also a sugar addict too mm -hmm. i'm a, i struggle with that deeply in fact i the last couple of nights i've had like chocolate bars yeah like, dipped with peanut butter can't go wrong can't go wrong with that but no i i need the pure <laughs> fix give me a cotton candy thing and i'll freaking down that whole 
<laughs> I'll get that old cotton candy. <laughs> Which I did. I drove my son. I drove down to Florida with my son and his wife when they moved down there back in August. I drove with his wife in the car and I had these like cotton candy tubs left over from my birthday party. So I was like, oh, well, Bram, I think I ate like four of them on the drive down. She's just <laughs> looking at me like, damn, girl. <laughs> you <got> a problem. <laughs> and then I'm crying like, oh, my God, I gained 10 pounds. I don't know how. <laughs> Did it be the cotton candy? I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. But you know what? Also, with how we eat, there's also an emotional you know, and I know it too. That's the thing. That's what's more frustrating. I, I know there's like an emotional attachment to it. You know, a lot of times in, in school or when you're growing up, right, you're, you're rewarded with food and yeah. most of nine out of 10 times is something sweet. So yeah. we have this association of sugar with something good. And that's, you know, it's, it's hard to like break that addiction. It really is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that I, I was, I feel like I could just talk to you forever. Uh, but <laughs> My wife. But we, we have a life. <laughs> <laughs> My wife and I were driving the other day through town mm -hmm. and I seen this young girl and she was just like severely overweight. And yeah. to me, I was just like, this is that's so sad because like so many people don't even realize what they're doing to themselves. Yeah you know, by just indulging the way they do with food. Like I'm, I indulge greatly with my food. Mm -hmm. Like if you see me eat, you'll be like, damn, he's a fucking pig. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, like so many people, like they'll, they'll eat that way and then they don't work out and there's yeah. no accountability for themselves whatsoever. Well, that's a whole, you could do a whole podcast just on that because I mean, look at how society, I mean, body image is one thing, mm. but we, we are this severe obesity thing you're you're not helping you are not helping people by that because that we all know obesity leads to you know depression it leads to health risk leads to so many terrible things these people are going to die young or just be immobile i mean i just came home from disney world the amount of people that are sitting on those little scooters and they're massively huge yeah. and you know, oh, love your body. Yeah, you should love your body enough to take care of it and be healthy. <laughs> <laughs> not that you can't even walk. That's, yeah. that's not good. Yeah, absolutely. I, I completely, completely agree with that. I mean, because that's like the, the first form of self-love, right? Is to take yeah. care of yourself to where you feel good as a person. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, so. thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed our conversation. Yes, this was a lot of fun. And I hope that we can do it again um, soon. Yes. And, um, I hope that your event goes well. I'll I'll promote it on social media also when I Aww, see it. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, do you have any links? I, you do have a link because you sent me a link about the event. Um, well, uh, not the event itself, but anything. My website's the best place to go. Okay, which well, I'll I'll attach all that into the show notes. So yeah, yeah, it's just my name, inezbarbario.com. And then like my I I after Roger up, I finally started a, a business Instagram that so people aren't going to Positano Dreamer, like, why is Inez on you know nothing but Italy pictures? <laughs> so I finally did start like a business Instagram, which was I think it's Inez underscore Barbario. You're following it, so you know, you'll find it. But yeah, we're, we're I'm getting back into the groove of things now and it feels really good. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, good luck to everything. And um, all that will be in the show notes. And this was, this was a blast. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Well, take care. And, and you know what? I, I know they're working another Roger up event. So hopefully we'll be able to connect there for sure. I'll be there for sure. And um, yeah. Are you going to be there again? I hope so. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks okay. again. And uh, you have a good evening. All right. Thanks. You too. Take care. All right. Bye. All right, bye.